How's it going, everybody? Welcome to Rest TV. I'm Russell Lewis. And before we get started, I just want to wish you all a very happy 4th of July. Please be safe. So now that we got that out of the way, I just wrapped up an amazing interview with a phenomenal leader. And he is currently the Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategic Deterrence and Nuclear Integration at the Pentagon. And he is also nominated to become the first African-American United States Air Force Academy Superintendent. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, I'm talking about Lieutenant General Richard Clark. And we talk about everything. We talk about his recent nomination to become the superintendent at the academy. We talk about General Brown. We talk about Chief Master Sergeant Joanne Bash. We talk about my fraternity brother, Donovan Carroll. We talk about weapons school, becoming a distinguished graduate, what that means, what it doesn't mean. But the one thing I'm super excited about is the fact that we talked about the Tuskegee Airmen and their legacy, their impact, what they were able to accomplish and what it means for people like myself, people like him and people like you. I am a captain in the United States Air Force. I am an air battle manager and I created a platform where civilian and military members can connect with the next generation of leaders. I understand the importance of mentorship because it changed my life. I wanna make sure that everybody gets that opportunity. So without further ado, welcome to Mentorship Moment. Right, so welcome back to another Mentorship Moment. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the recently nominated a man who is about to uh, make history. I have Lieutenant General Richard Clark. Sir, how you doing? I'm doing good, Russ. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. Sir, I promise you the pleasure is all mine. Uh, with this recent nomination, I have to ask the question. You are a United States Air Force Academy grad, and now you have the distinct honor and privilege, and you have earned this honor and privilege to possibly go back and be the academy superintendent. How do you feel about that? Well, first, I'm excited, but really it comes down to being very honored. Uh, they had a lot of people to choose from, and I was blessed enough to be the selection, at least at this point in the process. I'm just honored. I'm humbled by this, too, because I would have never thought when I was a cadet 34 years ago that I'd be going back as a superintendent. So very humbled, but I I am blessed and I appreciate this opportunity for me and my family. I got to be honest with you. I did not know that the United States Air Force Academy even existed until I joined Air Force ROTC. I had no exposure and I, don't hope, and I hope I'm not jumping the gun with this, but if you had to tell any young person considering going to USAFA or the Academy or even just joining the military, what advice would you give them? Like you, Russ, I didn't know anything about the military. My family was not military. I, I went to Richmond City Public Schools in Richmond, Virginia, and I had a guidance counselor who introduced me to the Air Force Academy. I wanted to fly. I knew that. And so I pursued that avenue. But what I would say to anybody who's thinking about the military is there's a lot of ways to, to enter the Air Force or any branch of service. ROTC, OTS, Air Force Academy, or any other service academy, there's lots of ways. And you, if you think you want to do that, you have to find the one that best fits your lifestyle, your aspirations, the things that you want to do. So I think there, any of them are great. Now, the Air Force Academy worked out well for me because I was able to play a sport there. I played football while I was there. The opportunities for me to become a pilot were, I would say, better there than maybe some other commissioning sources. Also, the price was right. I can remember thinking about that when I was, a, when I was in high school. I was like, what? They pay for everything. I mean, you mean everything. And then they pay you. You get a paycheck, like you do in ROTC. I remember thinking, man, I'm going to get my whole education paid for. I'm going to get this top-notch education. I'm going to get to play a sport, and I'm going to come out with a great job, you know, serving something, uh, a purpose bigger than myself. So in the end, it fit me. Now, I will say people go, oh, it was free. Well, it's not free because you're working. I mean, you're putting, the, you're putting in the time, right? And there's a lot of effort that has to go into that. But uh, in the end, I think that I got more than I gave coming out of the Air Force Academy. So I think there's goodness there. And for anybody who thinks they might want to join the military, what you have to do is really 
research and look at every different possible path that you could take. And, and in the end, you just got to pick the one that's best for yourself. My son is 18 years old and he's uh, going to uh, ROTC. He's going to be a, a ROTC cadet. And he also got into the Air Force Academy. He looked at both and he decided that ROTC was, was the best path for him. Right now, he's, he's thanking his lucky stars because he knows I'm going to be at the Air Force Academy now. If he had gone there, it might have been rough. But in the end, he weighed his options and, and he picked what was best for him. So that's what I would advise any, any young person to do. But the military is a great way to start your, start your life. I mean, you get opportunities and training and really development for, for the future in the military like, like nowhere else. I, I highly recommend it, but again, you, you have to look at what you need, what works best for you, and then pick the best path. Let's talk about history for a minute, sir. We are in a very unique time uh, in our nation and our society, and I can't lie to you. I'm excited. You will be the very first African-American superintendent. So before we go to the rest of the history that has been made, I want to talk to you about that one. How do you feel about being the first? Is it like a heavy weight? Is it um, overwhelming? Or are you approaching it the same way you approach every other assignment or every other tour? Yeah, Russ, you know, uh, so in, in some ways it's exciting. In some ways it's a little bit routine, I would say, because there's a lot of jobs that I've been put into where I was the first African-American to do that. And, and I would venture to say, there may be jobs that, that you've been in that there haven't been other African-Americans doing that job. I mean, it could happen because we don't have, I would say, the level of diversity through our, throughout our force that we might want to have. I know that our senior leaders are working on it. We have been working on it, and we have a lot of work to do. The point is that I, I have to take this job just like I would any other job that I have, whether I was the first or whether I was the fifth or the tenth. Whatever it is, I just have to go and perform. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line for all of us as we step into our jobs to understand the responsibility that we've been given. Not let any added responsibility weigh us down, but to just step in and get it done and to give our best every day, regardless of, of what history might be bringing with that job, if you, if you know what I'm saying. It's not lost on me, though that it is a historic moment and I am honored and proud of that. But in the end, I just got to go and perform and do my best every day. So let's talk about the rest of that history. General CQ Brown, Chief Master Sergeant Joanne Bass, they have been selected to lead our United States Air Force. How do you feel about that, sir? I'm excited. I'm excited and I'm honestly proud of our Air Force that we selected amazing people to fill those uh, jobs. I know General Brown, I've known him for a long time, and I will tell you, we couldn't have made a better choice. He is an amazing airman. He's got the background, would be a dream for anybody to have in a chief of staff. He is the perfect fit for this job. Now, the fact that we chose him based on not color of his skin, but really the content of his character just, just makes me proud. That's why we picked him because he's the best person for the job. I know that he's gonna go in there and do great things for our Air Force. But again, it's historic. And I hope that it breaks down some barriers for other people as we go forward, not only at his rank, but throughout the ranks. And as people see him perform, they're gonna recognize that we should choose people based on, on how great and, and how prepared they are for any given job. And the same with Chief Bass. I mean, she is a phenomenal leader. I don't know her personally, but I certainly know her by reputation. Again, we couldn't have made a better choice. So these two people are really opening doors, I think, for the rest of us to pave the way for greater diversity, more inclusion in our Air Force, and hopefully in our country. I'm proud of them. I'm proud of our Air Force for making these selections. I just look forward to serving both of them. What is the day-to-day -day life like for a general officer in the United States Air Force? Man, that's a good one. That's a good one. Probably a lot like yours. You know, you got a family. I got a family. You try to get your workouts in. You, you have your personal life, your personal goals and things that you try to achieve for yourself. 
but then you have a job that you are committed to that you have to make sure that you perform on that job every day and that you're giving our country what it's asked of you. To me, it's all about balance and finding that right balance on a daily basis. I see a lot of my teammates, folks who are working uh, in my directorate, who have, I would say, a busier day at work than even I have sometimes, but they're able to find that balance and they're able to do that with their families, with their personal goals and, and objectives, and then with their work lives. So I, I start early in the morning, I get a workout in, I go into work, I just start start getting after it, you know, whether it's meetings, whether it's phone calls, emails, products that we're trying to put out. I work with my team very closely all day. I answer to our chief, to, to our secretary, and then I try to get home in time to have dinner with my family and spend a little time with them. And then sometimes I might have a little work to do at home, but I just try to find a way to balance. Like right now, I'm trying to teach my daughter to drive, right? So I try to get home in plenty of time so that I can de-stress from work because the stress is about to build right back up when I get in that car with her. But it's, it's important for me to find the balance in all those things. And I would imagine everything that I just laid out, a lot of people would say, man, that sounds like my day. Well, I, I imagine we all have a very similar sort of battle rhythm, very similar balances that we have to work daily. But it's important that we find that balance. If you don't, frankly, you're not going to perform at any of those jobs as a, as a, as a family person, as, a, as an officer or an airman, just for yourself. If you don't strike the right balance, something's going to fail, and then you're no good to anybody. You're no good to anybody. So I just try and have tried to find that balance in every job that I've had and, and to make it work. Has there ever been an assignment that really pushed you to your limit, but you came out on the other side of that assignment way better. Yes. So I've, I've had a couple of assignments and usually it's when I was in command. So I've had the opportunity for a couple of commands and those are the jobs that really push me to the limit because now you have a lot more people that are counting on you to help them find that balance, to help them do their, their job every day, to help them find their balance uh, at, in their personal lives, but to achieve the mission and to accomplish that mission. So a lot of times that pushed me to, a, I think, a, a greater limit because I was spending more time helping others, you know, and really focusing on their lives. But in the end, it forced me to set an example of balance for them. And I really had to work hard to do that because you could easily get consumed by a job. And, I, you know, I could have worked 20 hours a day, especially when I was in command. But you have to find the balance. Um, it would have wrecked me if I, if I had tried to work 20 hours a day. My wife would have wrecked me if I had done that. And frankly, I wouldn't have been setting a good example for my people. So as a leader and as leaders, we all have to set that right example for our folks by the kind of life that we live beyond just our daily lives on the job. You want to set an example so they go, you know what? If the boss can take leave, I can take leave. If the boss can get home for dinner every night, I can get home for dinner every night. If the boss can go teach his daughter to drive, I can go teach my daughter to drive or get to the basketball games or the football games or whatever it is. Set that example, find that balance. But when I was in command to your question, that was when it was the hardest for me because the responsibilities were bigger, but I felt more pressure to set a good example for everybody else and striking the balance. But in the end, I think it taught me. It taught me better how to do that. I know we were talking a little bit about uh, biographies and I told you that for a long time, I've always kind of not studied them, but just found the little details and biographies that just stood out. Um, and one thing that stood out to me was actually four things. <laughs> you have been a distinguished graduate on four occasions through, throughout your career. So I wanted to ask you, number one, how did you do it? Because I know people who have never DG'd anything. And for those uh, people who don't know what DG is, it is say you go to a school, squadron officer school, right? You are in the 
top 10 percentile. And let me know if I'm if I'm messing this up, sir. You're in a top 10 percentile of that course or of that class or that schoolhouse. You've done that four times. How did you do that, sir? And what what was the significance of it? So I think the bottom line to that was every time I get into the school or whatever I'm doing, I put the effort in. You know, my goal is always to give it 100%. So I always, always, uh, I studied hard. I did the things that were requested of me or required of me in that school. And I always tried to do my best. And, and I mean, actually putting the work in. The significance of being a distinguished graduate, I mean, it's, it's good. I'm honored by that. But the fact is, it wasn't the end state. It wasn't what I was trying to achieve in that school or that opportunity. What I was trying to achieve was to learn all that I could in that school and um, to come out of it with all the things that, that I was supposed to come out of it with. And it was just a matter of putting the, the work in and actually focusing, writing papers, doing readings, taking tests, whatever it was, at every opportunity. I just tried to do everything that I could to learn and to, and to make that my goal and my focus in that course. It just so happened that I came out in, in that top 10%, but really it's about what you learn. And I'll say this too, a lot of times schools build on each other, right? So I go to a school, squadron officer school, let's say, and I learned some things and I really focused and I really worked hard to try to do well there. Well, when I get to the next school, there's things that I had learned in the previous school that I was able to bring with me that helped me to, to build on that when I got to the next school and the next one and the next one. So there's sort of a building block approach to learning. You, you learn something in one opportunity that you can bring into the next one and the next and the next. So you build your pattern, but you only build that by putting the effort in and really putting a lot of work and being committed to learning. And I think all of us have a desire to learn because we, we wouldn't be talking to you right now if we didn't have a desire to get better, right? To try to improve ourselves in some way. So I always have taken learning opportunities very seriously and really put the effort in. Sometimes people go to a school and they see it as a break from the daily grind. They see it as a break from the job. You know, that's okay. And I'm not saying that there's, if that's your goal and that's what you want to do, then you get what you need to get out of it, but you, you, time, you take some time to recharge or, or reconnect with family or whatever it is. But for me, I tried to strike a balance of learning everything that I was supposed to learn, but also having that opportunity to recharge. And I really took those, those learning opportunities seriously. Whether you're a DG or not, a distinguished graduate is not that important. But whether you learned everything that you could and made yourself better coming out of that school, that's what's the most important thing about it. So, sir, not to harp on on DG or any school, but I got a fraternity brother, uh, Donovan Carroll. He's a B-52 pilot. He is amazing. He's just DG weapon school. And I told him, I was like, hey, man, I'm talking to a GOAT this Saturday, and I want to mention your name. And he was like, yeah, go for it. To be a DG at a weapons school is significant. That is one of the toughest schools in the entire Air Force. To come out of that as a DG, you are at the tip top of your game because just graduating from that school is significant. But when you come out of there as a, a distinguished graduate, I'm telling you, you have performed and excelled, and I guarantee it, you are going to go into your unit ready to be a, a huge contributor. So. I would like to say uh, congratulations to Donovan because that is amazing and I'm proud of him, especially in the B-52 because that's a tough airplane. It's old, it's rickety, but man, it, it gets it done. But you've got to be a, a superior operator to get that airplane to do what it needs to do on its mission. So congratulations to Donovan. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. He is an amazing person. And when it comes to being humble, approachable, and credible, I feel like he embodies all of those things. So definitely, Donovan, congratulations. I'm super proud of you. And I know I can't top Lieutenant General Clark, but I just want to say congratulations, man. No, no, you topped it by bringing his name up. And, you know, you brought something else up too, Russ. That, you know, in the weapons school, learning how to fly your airplane is important. 
I mean, that, that really is why you go there. But a thing that you come out of there that's equally important are some leadership traits that you just mentioned. And I'm impressed that you brought it up. Having, uh, I don't think you've been to weapons school yet, but um, not yet. But I, I highly recommend it if you get that opportunity. But humble, approachable, and credible for us as leaders, I think those are the ultimate traits that you can have. Because if, if your people that you're leading, first they see that humility in you and they understand that you, you put your pants on just like they do every day or you put your uniform on the same way that they do every morning and you live the same kind of life that they do, that you are not necessarily any more special than they, they will be able to relate to you and they will be able to understand what you're trying to impart on them. So that humility is critical and that humility helps you to listen to them and to empathize and to really understand where they're coming from. So Humility is, I think, the number one leadership trait for any of us at any given time. Approachability, imagine if you have a huge amount of knowledge to, to impart on people, a huge amount of wisdom that you can give them on a daily basis, but they don't feel like they can come up to you and talk to you. They can't approach you. Then all of that knowledge goes to waste, right? It is contained within you and you can't get it out to anybody. So that approachability that you learn at the weapons school is vital because they give you a lot of information, a lot of knowledge, a lot of understanding, but you have to be able to get that out to other people. So being approachable for all of us, whether you're a weapons school graduate or whether you're a security forces flight chief, you have to be approachable and your people have to feel comfortable talking to you. And then the credibility piece, if you don't know what you're talking about, they'll never want to come, they never want to come talk to you again. But you know what? Here's the thing. You don't always have to know everything. The first part about credibility is knowing what you don't know. And if someone asks you something, and I will tell you, I, this happens to me all the time because there's so much that I don't know that I get questions asked of. And my answer many times is, I don't know, but I can go find the answer. I don't know what, what you're exact, looking for exactly, but I'll, I'll go figure it out and I'll get back to you. But the first time you try to pull the wool over someone's eyes with an answer that you are making up or is half-baked, they will not come back to you again. So your credibility is on the line. And it's okay for you not to know everything and still be credible. You just have to admit it. I don't know everything, but I'll get the answer for you. So humble, approachable, and credible are three incredible traits that I know uh, Donovan has picked up. But I think for all of us, those are three traits, especially the humility trait that we should all try to employ in our, in our daily lives and our leadership. Those three words have such a huge significance. And I would even go so far as to say, if we as a society would uh, really abide by those three words and embody those three words, we would be off in such a greater place right now. And I wanted to talk to you about a recent article that was put out, and I'm going to just read off the title of it. It is, The Air Force Admits uh, Persistent and Constant Racial Bias Against Black Airmen uh, Records Show. Uh, and what I wanted to talk to you about was, have you ever experienced any racial bias or discrimination while serving? That's a good question. So the thing about racial bias and discrimination or gender bias or any kind of bias or discrimination is sometimes you don't even know or you're not sure if that's really what you're experiencing. You suspect a lot of times that it's there, but it's so hard to put your finger on it. Now, there have been some times where I was pretty sure, you know, because it was, it was, on, it was blatant. But there have been more times where I, I wasn't sure, but I had a pretty good idea. And then there's probably a lot of other times where I had no idea. Something just happened and I didn't know why. I didn't understand the reasons behind it. And, and that's the problem with it because sometimes there's biases that are, that are part of the institution. There's biases that are subconscious in people's minds that make it sort of insidious and, and they just kind of creep out and they creep up on people. And I think that this problem that we're dealing with in the justice system right now is, is a part of that. It's something 
that a lot of times I don't think that people might have been doing these things consciously, but the system and maybe some unconscious biases were leading to these results that we're seeing. And the results are clear, right? I mean, we're seeing in a certain rank structure, you know, E1 to E4, that we're seeing a pretty significant bias there. So there's something going on and it's very clear, but exactly what is it is, is pretty difficult. So right now I'm really proud that the Air Force first stepped up and, and owned it. And that was, uh, I think that's the first step. You gotta own it. And now there's a, a big investigation and trying to figure out really what are the root causes of this and what do we need to do about it as an Air Force? I think we're looking at a lot of policies. In fact, I'm, I'm a part of the committee that's looking at this. So I, I don't want to talk too much about it until we sort of get through the results. But I'll say we are doing due diligence on this. We're bringing a lot of outside people in to, to help take a look at it. Our inspector general is leading the charge on this. But we have to look at the root causes and what are some of the policy implications because we need to get to the right policies so that we don't have these kinds of biases occurring and that our, our airmen are all treated equally, regardless of gender, regardless of race or ethnic background. That's the kind of force that we need to be. We've been dealing with these problems for a long time, unfortunately, not only in the Air Force, but in our country, there's been a, a wake-up call, you know, since uh, a lot of the incidents, I think, sparked by the incredibly horrible incident with uh, Mr. Floyd, with George Floyd, but that just, that was a spark of a lot of other things. And we can, we can rattle off names of incidents, but really it's about the, the tone, it's about the policies that we have, and it's about the unconscious biases, I think, that we have, that we have to start dealing with. And we're taking steps. We've been taking some steps, but we need to take bigger steps in, in the Air Force in particular. So um, we're getting after this now, but it makes me sad that we're still dealing with this and that we're still talking about it. But I'm encouraged because I, I think there's been a kind of an awakening and we're, we're starting to move forward. And it's not, just, it's not just black folks that are looking at this. When you look at the protests and you see the people who are out there protesting, it is everybody. It is white, black, Latino, you know, men, women just people, Americans, that are fed up with this. It has to be that way, because this isn't a, a Black problem, this is an American problem. And until we get it solved, our country is going to be hindered, and we have to keep working on this. So I'm encouraged that, that we're starting to deal with it, but we have a long ways to go, for sure. I'm glad to hear that you are a part of that. I'm extremely excited and, and proud of you for stepping up and doing it. That, that means a lot, just to hear. I kind of want to switch gears for a second. On 19 July, I have the pleasure of working with Legacy Fight Academy as their media manager. And what we're going to be doing is called uh, Legacy Flight Across America. And we're trying to continue on with the, the, the history and the impact of the Tuskegee Airmen. And I want to ask you about, about those legends uh, what do the Tuskegee Airmen mean to you and who you are as a pilot, as a leader, just in all aspects of life? Man, so a long time ago in my career, I got introduced for the first time to a actual Tuskegee Airman, an original Tuskegee Airman, uh, Mr. Herbert Carter. I got to spend a little time with him. I was just, I was young officer. I had read about the Tuskegee Airmen. I understood what significance they had in our victory in World War II. But when I heard him talk about his experiences, not only in the war and how just incredible of a fighter pilot he was and, and his uh, fellow Tuskegee Airmen, but what they experienced when they came back to the United States and what their opinions were, how they had to fight for a country that was blatantly discriminating against them as black men. Yet, they still held to that higher purpose, that higher purpose of our constitution, of our country to support and defend. And they did what they needed to do for our country despite how they were being treated. And that inspired me, that they would put their personal woes and their personal issues aside and still serve. 
despite what was going on. Right now in our country, we can look at these issues, right? All of us could look at these issues and say, especially those of us wearing a uniform and say, why, why am I willing to put my life on the line for a country that would treat someone who looks like me that way? Well, look at the Tuskegee Airmen. Look what they did. And look at how the country was treating them back then in the 1940s. Those guys were heroes. Those guys changed the world because what they did and the performance that they had in World War II showed everybody what racial discrimination and how, how just incredibly backwards it was and how it prevented people from doing things that they could do. They showed the world, it didn't matter what color you are, what you look like. All that mattered is, is your ability to go out and get the job done. And they did it. And they showed the world and it led to the, the desegregation of the armed forces, which then led to desegregation in our country and led to the Civil Rights Act. You know, you can, you can draw the path from what they did to so many things that changed the world for us today. And I look at those guys and say, they, they are pathfinders for us. I will tell you, General Brown might not be going where he is uh, headed right now if it weren't for them. That I wouldn't be sitting right here right now talking to you as a potential for the uh, U.S. Academy, U.S. Air Force Academy superintendent, but for them. The same with Chief Bass, the same with you and, and many of us who are sitting here right now. I look at them and I say, you talk about the Air Force values, right? Integrity first, service before self, excellence in all we do. They epitomize that. And they changed the world because they did. Not because they were black, not because of anything other than who they were as men. So yes, they had a huge impact on me, both from an inspiration standpoint, but also just from a practical standpoint. I'm sitting right here because of the foundation that they laid. And if you ever come into my office, what you'll see is an array of Tuskegee Airmen posters, picture. I hold them up as heroes uh, for me. They changed the world because of what they did. And I think we all have the opportunity to change the world in our own way as a result of the things that we do or we will do. So they're, they're perfect examples. Proud to even be associated with them and have them as a part of my heritage. I've only been starstruck one time in my life. And it was when I got to meet Brigadier General Charles McGee. And oh, yeah. he's, he's maybe five, oh. eight. But man, he was like 10 feet tall to me. Uh, I literally sat for about two, three hours wanting to go and speak to him. But I just, I was like, I can't, like, I can't go, I can't go talk to him. But when I did, when I mustered up enough courage, it was like the, the most humble, amazing person ever. But uh, yeah, that was the only time I've ever been starstruck. A true hero, a true just all around amazing person. You know, one of my prized possessions, I have a, um, I have a, a P-51 red tail. It's, a, it's, you know, it's about a foot and a half long. And I've, I've gotten it signed by, because uh, I, I, as I've met these guys, I'm like a kid, right? I carry this airplane around with me. Anytime I think I'm going to meet one of these guys, and I've had them signed so many times, uh, Charles McKee, um, Lee Archer, um, uh, Herb Carter, there's, I mean, the list goes on and on, but I have about eight of them who signed this airplane for me. For me, is a legacy item for my kids. They know who the Tuskegee Airmen are, and this is the thing that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass down to them because, I, like you, uh, they won't have a chance to meet Charles McGee. They won't have a chance to meet Lee Archer. But what I want to make sure is that they understand the heritage that they left behind. So I will always, always make sure that that lives on. You and I have been fortunate enough to meet these men, but what, what I want to make sure is that, that their legacy is remembered, and I think it will be. I know it will be. There's no question. Any singular piece of advice that you will want to give anybody going through anything or just trying to figure out life, if you had to give any advice, what would it be? Here's what I would say. In everything you do, find that greater purpose. There is, there is a 
um, an inspiration that comes when you aspire to attain a purpose that's bigger than yourself, something that's bigger than you, that's even bigger than your, your team, but something that you aspire to and that when you are doing whatever it is that you're doing, you will achieve bigger, greater things when it's about something bigger than you. So find that purpose. Find that thing in your life that you want to, to drive to every day that makes you get up in the morning and say, all right, I'm getting up because of that. And it might be, it might be faith-driven. It might be the, the Constitution. It might be, um, you know, there's a lot of things out there. Right now in our country, there's a lot of higher purpose issues that we can all attain, uh, aspire to, right? Find those purposes, find those things that will allow you to, um, to drive to something bigger. And I believe that that will inspire us to greater performances as well. Because when you're driving, it's kind of like the New Orleans Saints played for New Orleans after uh, Katrina, and they played an inspired football season. They, they shouldn't have played that well. But they aspired and, and were inspired by a greater purpose. It wasn't just about winning for uh, the, the sake of the Super Bowl. It was about winning for their city, the people in their city, to inspire their city to be better. So we should all look for that higher purpose in everything that we do every day. Whatever it is, achieve and attain something bigger than you. And uh, I, I recommend that to, uh, to everybody who's listening. But the other thing that I would say is find that balance in your life. Take care of your family, take care of yourself, take care of your job or your profession or whatever it is, whether it's military or outside the military, but you have to find that balance and strike that balance so that you, uh, you're able to achieve uh, greater things, not only for you, but for those around you. So I, I think those would be my sort of parting comments. But the last thing I'd like to say is thank you for what you're doing. I, I think the fact that you're sitting there right now and, and putting this podcast out is striving for a higher purpose, to help other people be more than they would be otherwise, to help them to understand how they can achieve greater things and to help others be all they can be. That's a purpose bigger than yourself for sure. So I want to say thank you for doing that and just for being a, a, a great leader yourself. And uh, I look forward to meeting you in person one day. We've been able to talk on the phone and, and email and text and now here. So we got to take that to the next level and, and someday get to shake hands and, uh, and meet in person. So thank you for having me today and for this great session. All right, everybody. This has been another episode of Mentorship Moment. I appreciate you all for tuning in. We'll see you all next week.